beginner. All right. <laughs> be all right. Go sure. Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New Scotland Historical Society, the 27th of September, 2007. Approximately 10 a.m. interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Well, my name is Tom Thomas Arthur Kendall. I was born on August the 13th, 1923, in Syracuse, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to going into the service? Uh, only high school. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't go to college or seminary till later, of course. Okay. So I. So you completed high school. I finished high school and. Uh, I'd say that the war, the Pearl Harbor, happened while I was 18 years of age. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Where were you when you heard about that? Well, that was that was I was just with a bunch of fellows, young fellows, and uh, just in a store, I think, listening to the radio. But uh, I was about one month from graduating from high school. Mm -hmm. so I was 18 years of age when I when that uh, took place, and of course, for, for all of my friends, you know, it was just a matter of those who had gotten out of school a month or two be or a year, year before were already uh, dashing down the next day and signing up. So any number of them, of course, joined the mm -hmm. various branches of the service. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, was kind of left behind there, I suppose, because I still had a month to go to school. So that was where I heard about it, of course, and like everyone else, uh, wondered what that meant. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why did you decide to enlist? Well, I have a kind of an interesting story there. I, I decided to enlist because I wanted very much to be a Marine or a, a Navy, Navy personnel. And uh, what happened was that I couldn't pass the, uh, I passed the physical completely, but I was colorblind. Oh. So to make a long story short, I, I waited uh, some months, and, uh, just a couple months more, and I joined the uh, Army Air Force. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, they accepted me. So no, no, why did you decide on the Air Corps? Well, uh, can I say that's about what was left for me? <laughs> <laughs> that, that matter of uh, being colorblind is uh, not a, a funny thing. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. a difficult thing. And uh, it meant a lot to me at that time to, to be a Marine or a Navy. My friends were going that way. But uh, I'm here today. Mm -hmm. I think that says something, so mm -hmm. I made my way through. But I, uh, I was fortunate that I got into the Air Force because I hadn't anticipated that, but I didn't want to be a foot soldier. So at that time, being being as it was the uh, you know, the Army Air Force, mm -hmm. I can say more about what took after I, I you know, joined and uh, was sent to Fort Niagara up here. And from there on, to basic training. My basic reason was that uh, I did try to become a CB. They wouldn't take me there either. So, hmm. no, no. Where did you go for your basic? I went to St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, of course took all of the tests for qualification, see what I could, what I was, uh, might be able to do in the service. Uh, I can't tell you right now how this happened, except that they asked for volunteer gunners. I didn't really know, I think, at that time what that meant except that it meant flying, and that sounded interesting to me. And of course, I didn't realize what they meant by gunners. So uh, when I, they accepted me, of course, right away, because they were, they were uh, at that time, just happy to get people looking to get gunners. It was of such a nature that uh, they promoted you right away once you finished being, you know, your training as a gunner. Mm -hmm. Rather interesting thing that in, Two months and 14 days after I went into the service, I was a sergeant. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you look back and see what some of these fellows did, that certainly were more deserving of it. But that was the, <coughs> the nature of it, I suppose, because of the what was going to occur after that. Where did you go for your gunnery school? I went to Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, completed the gunnery school there. And then I went on to uh, to Denver, Colorado, to Armament School, where mm -hmm. I was trained in armament bombs and that, so I became an armor gunner. So my job was to, uh, to pull the pins on the bombs and move the target, things like that, and of course to be prepared to, 
be of assistance to somebody who might have trouble with the guns if they weren't sure. Mm -hmm. Later on, I, I ended up here in Westover Field, Massachusetts. It's an instructor and air and air gunner. He after I came back from overseas, doing that B-24 bombers instead of B-17s. All right. Um, after you went to gunnery and armory school, where, where did you go? Well, from there, I, my recollection of that is I went from there to a, to a Salt Lake City where I was in a, 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 a armory there with about a thousand other people waiting to be, to be uh, kind of sent someplace. It was there that I met a, a fellow from, from uh, my town that, that I had known, of course, and uh, who was also a gunner, later was killed over Schweinfurt. But uh, I met him and I knew his father off a little bit here, but I, after the service, I was, I was a firefighter in Syracuse for 12 and a half years as a professional firefighter, mm -hmm. and his father was uh, worked there in the department with me. So it was rather interesting that I should meet Russ, and, and then, of course, and I learned later that he was killed. Mm -hmm. I was on that mission myself. But uh, that, I went there, and then from there to, uh, I was assigned to a crew. Mm -hmm. This is where I met my crew for the first time, and uh, of course, it was that kind of thing that you gather together with nine other people you've never met, mm -hmm. and yet learning to live with them and having, of course, such a unique relationship over the years <coughs> to me. <coughs> excuse me. But uh, I was assigned to the crew, and uh, it was, uh, of course, each uh, each person on the crew had a particular position, of course. Obviously, pilots were pilots, but gunners are, are radio operators, and engineers as you probably already know and the, the thing about that was that the, the, the two armorers, armors or gunners were either the wall turret or the tail, tail gunner and the other fellow that was there and they said what, what position would you like the wall turret or the tail and I said well I'll fly the tail and that was the beginning of my time there as a tail gunner and of course he, he flew in the other position and uh, as I look back on it now I got the better deal I think mm -hmm. Because that was a that was a tough spot to be in that ball turret. But then we went on to uh, from there to of course into training. We went to uh, I guess I'd say stopped a couple of places, but we ended up in in Spokane, Spokane, Washington training. Now you uh, you were on B seventeens. B seventeens, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my missions on B seventeens uh, later as an instructor yeah. gunner on B twenty fours. But uh, yeah, I did that. And uh, we went out to Spokane, there we flew missions in Pendleton, Oregon, and there we, there we finished up our time. And this was, I was, I would, by that time I was 19, but anyway, we went there and that's where we completed our, our uh, time of training, at least in that, in that nature. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing about that was that uh, I got a five-day pass to go to Syracuse from Pendleton, Oregon. I rode three days on the nut on the train to get home, and I had to be back at, at uh, Grand Island, Nebraska. Well, I didn't know what at that time. I assumed it was kind of going somewhere in combat. But it took me a day to get back there, and so I had, I think, I came home like this afternoon and had to leave tomorrow night on a five-day pass. And I recall my, my poor mother standing on the platform in Syracuse and, and saying, I'll go with you to Chicago. And uh, I think one of the hardest things I had to do, I had to say to her, no, I said, I don't want you to do that. It's too much for you to do. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking back at her and, and seeing her there standing, you know, crying, weeping, and uh, kind of an emotional thing, but I, I don't forget that, you know, what it meant to her mm -hmm. and her son. My brother was also in the service, but he was in, he was in the Coast Guard, and then later he was a, also in the Air Force in Korea. And so in World War II, he was in. But that, that was our, at that, that point then, of course, going back to Grand Island is where we picked up a, a new B-17. And uh, from there we flew to, we flew to Bangor, Maine. Uh, step aside a minute, later on I, I never realized that Bangor, Maine would be where I'd take part of my seminary training uh, later on in life. But we stopped there, we went from there to Gander, Maine, Newfoundland. And uh, at 7 o'clock, like the next night or something like that, we took off and flew the ocean and landed in uh, 
Westbrook, Scotland the next morning. And the Queen of Feet, as far as I'm concerned, for those pilots all night long over the waters. Mm -hmm. We, we, uh, one, one of the planes, one of the planes, uh, ditched as they came into land. The interesting thing about it is we're all trained, of course, to be, you know, if you ditch, you get that, that dungy, that dinghy off there and get in it. Well, these fellas, one of them was telling me later, he said, I, uh, we, we landed, he said, we all got out on the wing, he said, and we let the dinghy go and get to get in. He said, we jumped into the water, it was up to our knees. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, we, uh, we, uh, uh, all these things, the Scots people there, he said, came out and they were dragging in pieces of the plane and everything else to get it up on shore. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't help but laugh at him, you know, that uh, up to their knees, they thought they were going to be floating around and it didn't happen. But we were then, of course, at that point, we then had to sit and wait a while and, of course, later be assigned to one, or I went to the 100th bomb group. Uh, so that was, that was uh, our introduction over there. I do remember one fellow coming to me and sitting down and then caught next to me or something. He said he pulled up his leg and he showed his leg and was badly shot up. And he said to me, this is what you can look forward to. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You know, I didn't have the slightest idea, you know, what would have really meant at this point. Just as a point of reference, this was this was the almost the uh, beginning time for the hundredth bomb group over there, which uh, uh, I think it was the I think I I, went, I flew on their twenty seventh mission out of three hundred and six that they had, but they. Uh, and uh, that kind of thing, uh, I kind of remember because we were we were actually uh, the first the first replacements after the initial bomb group had gone in there. Now you you went as a replacement crew. Yeah, the, the whole crew stayed together. Yeah, the Bowman Provisional Group. Mm -hmm. I still remember the name. And uh, my pilot was a uh, former infantry man. This sort of soldier army uh, who was great. Uh, he didn't die with us, but he later died mm -hmm. over France in a bombing mission. Uh, my pilot, of course, was who was here to see me, Keith Sprague. Uh, his picture, I guess, around here somewhere. Too, at least, I guess maybe Martha or somebody has it. Are you know, Martha Slingerman? But uh, all these fellows in different places, obviously. And, uh, we were blessed that we were. We didn't lose any of our crew members. We were blessed, so I don't have a spectacular story to tell, but I have incidents, of course, that where it was questionable. Things of that sort. But what was your first me. mission? My first mission was, uh, I think, I was thinking about that last night because we had an unusual happening group with us. Uh, I'll say that my first mission was over France, and. Uh, we, we didn't encounter any, any fighter problems on that anti-aircraft, of course, but no, no fighter. Uh, the next day, we were scheduled for a, a, a practice mission. And, uh, of course, when you fly in a practice mission, you can, I suppose, you can take the risk if you want, and some of them did. Fortunately, we were wise enough to put our guns in. And I had my twin, twin caliber 50s in the tail. I had those in there. And we were flying out up near the North Sea, and I don't know whether the, whether the navigator lost, one of the navigators who was kind of leading this thing, lost his way to some degree or took us too far north to the North Sea. But uh, suddenly, uh, my, my bombardier said, uh, hey, there's a aircraft out there. And I won't how, tell you how he described it, but he, but he said, those so-and-sos are shooting at us. And of course, we had never been in combat, remember. So all of a sudden, I, of course, I, as I say, had my guns, and I turned around, and if you know what the B-17 is like, I kneeled, as I had to do, and I, I just looked out the side window that I had, and when they went by, two of them went by, and when they did, they rolled over, and they showed the big cross. So I knew what it was. So we were in combat, whether we liked it or not. In fact, we shot down one of our planes and went down the channel. So it was, that was our first encounter with uh, enemy fighters with combat. It was supposed to be just a practice mission. Practice mission, and we, 
we did our best, you know, to, to claim that this was worthy of, uh, of attention, and they said, well, that's, that was just a practice mission. Well, it was certainly a different one. <laughs> but uh, a lot of them didn't put their guns in, and that was that they were, you know, just like sitting ducks. And we fortunately were able to fight back. And of course, I think we, we understood later that there was a German convoy down below somewhere, and they, they thought we were after them. Mm -hmm. But we were carrying these 100 pound breakfast bombs, and we couldn't do much with those. Anyway, that was, that was the first kind of a first mission was that easy one mm -hmm. called the milk runs, they call them. And, uh, and that, and then of course, then we began to pick up quite a bit of a uh, you know, flying pretty regu regularly. Mm -hmm. so, now, where uh, were most of your mission? What were most of your targets? Uh, factories? Well, uh, factories, uh, airfields. We bombed an airfield out of of Paris. We bombed, uh, we, we flew to Poland one day to hit a Messerschmitt factory there, which of course was a uh, low level and all the way for I think 9, 10, 12 hours, something like that. I say 10 hours, maybe. Now, define low level. But a low level. No, it wasn't, you know, I guess uh, 12, 13 feet, so it was 12, not much more than that because at 10 thousand they put you on oxygen. Mm -hmm. So when it would be uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, and of course we flew up over the, up through Norway and over that way, rather than, you know, we weren't going to fly across Germany or France, because that was all occupied. I was not there, uh, I was there all before the D-Day. So all my missions were flown before the it was, it was still occupied territory every time we flew over there. But uh, we made it. Now, as, as an um, armorer, could you describe as you're approaching the target what you had to do? Well, of course, pretty much, uh, you know, when you're getting there, the pilot's going to notify you that you're near the tiger to the navigator or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they, just before, just as you talk, when you get there, it's hard to say just when you do it, but you, you know, the armorer's got a, one of the armorers has got to pull the pins because. The bomb bay doors are open. You know, pull the pins. Now, what do you mean by pull the pins? Uh, just take the pin right out of the bomb, mm -hmm. you know, so that you could, so that it could be armed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that was about the extent of it. Well, you um, had to walk, uh, had to walk over on, a, a, a catwalk that was on the catwalk, and yeah. you did it from there. Yeah. Well, that did. was pretty dangerous work, though, wasn't yeah, it? That was well. It wasn't the most pleasant, but it was. It wasn't the hardest either. You now, know. did you have to take your gloves off to do this? Yeah, well, I, 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 did you? I don't think so. I don't remember doing that. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that very often. It was usually done by the other fellow who was, who would, well, he, sometimes he'd be down in the, uh, in the ball turret. Most of the time he would be. But, uh, you know, that was a, that was about a, kind of a limited duty for all of us. Mm -hmm. And somebody else could have even up. Even one of the other, even the radio operator could do that, I suppose, without, you know, he sits right there, you know, right where he is. So it, the main thing on this thing is that at that time, you know, the, the pilot uh, turns the thing over to the bombardier, mm -hmm. you may know that. And uh, the, of course, is, here it is, and the bombardier's got the plane, he'll say, it's yours now, his heart, bombardier was uh, Duncan McCormick, he was. It's a dunk. This is, you know, the plane's yours now. And of course, there's no evasive action or anything. You're just going through the flak. And of course, that's when it's the hardest, of course, because in that middle of that, you're obviously hearing the noises, which of course they tell me is after the fact, but you know, it's not enough to, to scare you and hear these things sometimes when they hit. But um, that's done. He, of course, he's got the plane in tow. He drops the bombs when he the bombs away. Well, then we. Like you say, get the hell out of here, <laughs> you know. And our pilot would then take, take back, take it back, and uh, that's what they do. And of course, being in formation, you when you went, you followed. Of course, you if you happen to be leading it, that's a different story. But lots of times you were in one of the either up, you know, the uh, oh, up in the top part of the flying, the high level of our, and then of course the middle, and then the lower. Mm -hmm. uh, I seem to have forgotten even the terms. Did you, did you fly the same plane most of the time? Uh, not really, no. We had a plane, but... Now, uh, the plane you brought over... They took it away from okay. us. Okay. They took it away from us. Did you get to name a plane? Yeah, our plane was called the Flying Jenny, which was, uh, of course,
course, uh, I didn't realize that that has a greater meaning than I thought. But of course, we could look at the jacket there. It has the it has the uh, donkey kicking bullets or kicking bombs. And of course, each those each one on that jacket there is a, it's a mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a fellow from the uh, Walt Disney who was in our, our group or in our yeah, in our group, and he, he used to do all the a lot of the artwork, so that's how those were done. What did he paint? Did you have anything painted on your nose? On the, on yeah, the they had the you know, flying jenny and the same thing. Mm -hmm. But those planes sometimes, you know, they, they'd be used by others. And they, you know, ours was, ours ended up, one of them at least, ended up being uh, struck by a plane that was taken off and, uh, and damaged it beyond repair. So it was that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. As for us, we flew different ones depending on what was available. Mm -hmm. And what the assigned is like, uh, but we did have a plane supposedly that was ours, as long as it lasted. Mm -hmm. you know. How did you come up with that name, Flying Jenny? And that was, I think, my pilot's idea. There, there, there's something to go with Flying Jenny, and I, I, I read about it lately, and I can't think of just what it was. But it was, uh, I always thought, well, Flying Donkey, you know. But there's some other name to it, something else that has, that has to do with it. And I wish I could tell you now, but I can't. I read it some time ago, and I thought, oh, that's different. But, uh, that's, that's not very helpful. But now, did good. this uh, Walt Disney artist decorate your jacket also? Yeah. Every time we had a mission or every couple of times, mm -hmm. he, would, he would put those on there for us. Mm -hmm. And I presume he did it for others in the um, group. Because mm -hmm. that was a nice jacket, as you can see, and it's, mm -hmm. it's held up well other than the cuffs. But it was uh, nice to wear and uh, an honor to wear it. And, I know he was kidding ourselves. All of us had a measure of pride about what we were doing, and yet at the same same time we were scared. We were, we were mindful that you know I I watched too many films go down, and for me to you know I, I I saw we were in a barracks and we we had I think we had four, I think we had three crews in a barracks, three or four. You know people would come in. And Where they, were you stationed in England? I was stationed in uh, called this. Uh, D.I.S.S. Uh, Bury St. Edmunds, there, not too far from Norwich, but uh, that's where we were all our time. And we would we would see these others come in. They say we we went, of course, we were the rookies, you know, the new people, and and uh, we flew pretty regularly. And uh, we, we had some got a couple places I could tell you some things that that are different. It's, it's different about what took place, and uh, maybe it fits in here with the oh, yes. idea of the missions themselves. But I have to say that on our, on our, uh, I think fifth mission, what they did, they would give you a three-day pass, and uh, we, we were supposed to go on this uh, mission, and uh, yes, we had we were scheduled. I remember the place it was Stuttgart, and the weather went bad. So they said, uh, well, you can't scrub the mission today, and you guys, you can, you can go to, on your path. So London was the place, obviously, we went to London. But this was on the, I, I won't ever forget it, it was on the 8th of October, 1943. And we went, we went to, to, to London, and we were there for three days. We came back on the 10th. I, I walked, walked in the barracks on that on the 10th, and there was one fellow lying down in the corner, his name was Newton, they call him. He was 35 and he was the old man, you know. And uh, I said to Newton, I said, where is everybody? He says, well, they've gone to Munster, they aren't back yet. And then he told me, he says, uh, on the 8th, he says, they went, the next day after we left, they went to Bremen, he said, and they lost eight ships out of our squad, out of our bomb group, I should say. So. Uh, Trying to remember, we either had 20 or 21 B-17s in a in a bomb, and there were four bombs, four squadrons. So, and he told me that they had lost eight. And uh, he said the next day they went to, I, I think, uh, I forgot what it was. It was whatever the target was. They didn't lose any. And that particular day, we waited till they came back, and they went out with 13 aircraft. And uh, when they came back that day, one came back. We lost 12 aircraft on that one day. Colonel 
Rosenthal. You may have heard of him somewhere along the way. He was the only one that brought his ship or came back. The rest of them either were prisoners of war or shot down. And uh, he stayed in for years and years. He flew some, an extra tour of duty. He was wounded a couple of times himself. And, and uh, he just died here recently. But we lost 20 aircraft in three days. It left us with just two planes, if I recall rightly. Uh, on the 14th of October, uh, they scheduled a mission. The 13th wing, I think it was, scheduled a mission for Schweinfurt, Germany, and we had we couldn't put up a, we couldn't put up a bomb to get over because we only had two planes. So what they did is they assigned us, the two of us, to the, the 390th bomb group. We flew that so-called TLM Charlie with the 390th. And that was probably the hardest, well, mission in a sense, although that other time that we did catch fire, we were alone, things like that. But that was probably the worst mission I was on because that day uh, we tacked on the end of them. And of course, we crossed the coast of France going in, and that's when the German fighters picked us up. And we fought them. And remembering that this time we didn't have fighter escort. We didn't have that kind of a uh, help. And we fought them all the way into the target in southern Germany. And uh, of course the flak was heavy. They'd always let you go, of course, once you got over the target, because then the anti aircraft picked you up. But as soon as we got done again, they got right on us again, and we fought them all the way back, all the way back to the French coast where we managed to get away. Uh, I watched things happening that day that are like you see on television. And I don't recall seeing that kind of thing. I saw planes go down at different times, but I never saw anything like that before. I, I was just counting shoots, German, German shoots from fighters and, and fight, you know, the other shoots, white ones from Americans. And uh, I just watched these. I recall one plane, I watched him that poor fellow flying out there all by himself and they went after him like flies after him, you know, uh, something sweet or something. They just picked at him until he, he blew all the pieces, you know. And we were watching, we were trained, you know, to uh, to see if you see a plane that's going down, try to count the chutes to see how many got out. You know, we didn't have any time for that. I was too busy firing at these, at these uh, German fighters. Uh, I used nearly 2,000 rounds of ammunition that, after, that day. When I got back, I had one belt on each side of my, I'd have been out of ammunition. I, of course, the guns were weak, carried a couple of boxes of it, but that's so much I had used today that day in order to just stand against them. So it was, it was that kind of a thing. And when the final report came through, we lost 65 bombers that day. So it was probably the greatest loss that I saw while I was there. I was fortunate. I didn't have to go to Berlin. I finished, I think, just before the first year. And maybe one mission before, or two missions before the Berlin hit. And of course, that was that was in '44. Now, what was the worst damage that your plane had? One that you were on? Uh, well, we were. We had different times, of course, different amounts of damage. Some more than other times, but we were we were flying one day over. Our target was uh, Durham, I think it was. Just, just before Cologne, I remember it because of what happened. But, and uh, as I say, these these aircraft, you know, we, we would fly, of course, in, in uh, formation, and uh, we sometimes flew with another another air, another bomb group, and we were led to stay to, we were following along somehow or other with uh, somebody else that was going ahead, bomb the target, make a right hand turn, and go on your way. And so that's what we were going to do. But the unfortunate thing was, it was like you were trying to turn down here off of us. New Scotland Road South or something coming to make a right turn and when you get there you got people lined up and they cut out and they cut out the first thing you know you're going another block before you can make a turn. Mm -hmm. That's about the way it was. We never got to make the turn and of course when we did we flew over Cologne which was a heavily armed uh, city and then Cologne is no well known at least just for the damage alone that, that it suffered. But we, uh, we went over the had to go over it. When they did, they opened up on us and they hit us. We caught fire. We lost an engine and we were on fire. And uh, of course, immediately we fell behind the rest of the group because that's when you were left by yourself. So we were left alone and uh, 
I, I you know this may sound like rather dramatic and the kind of thing you see on TV again, but believe it or not, our pilot, I, I remember the, the co-pilot saying, I can't feather the prop. I can't feather the prop, you know? Of course, I, I don't know how much you know, maybe you know more than I do, but that prop going like that wasn't mm -hmm. doing any good. And so uh, Bill Lakin, who was our pilot and a, and a good pilot, he, he did, he stuck the nose of that thing down and he, he brought it out and when he did, he blew out the fire. But in the meantime, I was watching all this stuff come by my windows and I was saying, man, that's the engine, you know? But it wasn't, it was frozen oil and stuff like that. But to me, it was, I had my shoe gun, I expected any minute he's gonna say, blow out the uh, door. You know? Again, there's not much for the tail gunner, it's like this. You pull the handle of the door, fold off, you're gonna die about the only way. And uh, I was scared, sure I was. Uh, I was praying. Uh, I wasn't particularly, uh, I wasn't in the same mood that I may be today as a young guy, and, uh, but I knew I needed help. And I remember saying, dear Lord, I don't want to bail out over Germany. Just let me get to France so I can find somebody who maybe will like me, you know, will like us. And uh, of course, unfortunately, when that happened, uh, we kept going. And I, I recall the, uh, the pilot saying, uh, where are we to the navigator? He says, well, we're, we're two hours inside of Germany, he says. And he said, so I know when we got a long ride. And so we were flying along, and we fully expected that if they knew we were around at all, we were going to be in combat. So we looked up, and we saw a couple of planes off in the distance, and he says, well, this, this is it. And you know, these planes came, came, and they stayed out far enough so they weren't within the range of our guns. And then they they kind of tipped themselves and they were American fighters. Yeah. They were two P P-47s, or P-51s, I'm not sure. But they were two, and they flew with us uh, almost into France. And then of course they had to leave because of the fuel. Mm -hmm. But they flew us then the rest of the way we made it out. And when we landed that plane, we landed it when we landed it, it burst into flames. And it burned right up there on the runway. I can remember the, uh, our crew chief coming out and saying, well, look what you did to my airplane, look what you did to my airplane. <laughs> it was all covered with foam, you know, and, and that. So there's some of those things that are kind of funny once in a while, you, know, you can look back and laugh. But he, uh, that was, that was, of course, there were other times. Uh, fortunately, at Schweinfurt, we, we were hit several times, but not uh, to the point where we had to worry about it in the same way. But it was a, that just happened to be a, a tough one because it was, so much time spent fighting the fighters because they just fought us all the way in, all the way out. Now, did you always wear a flat jacket? Uh, I don't, I don't remember, remember wearing a flat jacket, mm -hmm. to tell you, in those days. And some of the other things, I never wore a helmet kind of thing or anything like that. We wore, when we first got there, we had heated suits that were of the nature of, uh, I'd say, uh, well, I think they were, they were, the first suits were more like a, a long john, you might say. When you put them on, they were, they were warm, of course, lined with the waders, whatever mm -hmm. you call it. And they were, they maybe, I think they had a pair of gloves, and then they had the suit, and the boots were attached. And so in the, in the morning, at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you get up to, for briefing, uh, in the cold winter, the weather over there in England, uh, they jumped into those, and it was like getting warm, all, you know, all of a sudden you were warmed up. But, uh, they, they had a problem with those in as much as when they, when they had a bad spot, it would burn you. And if it happened short out in the light here, you couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and of course, the, the gloves you could take off, mm -hmm. but uh, the, uh, not with, the, uh, with the, that suit. So then they got the, the three-piece thing, the boots, and so that if you lost the boot, you could take it off. And uh, the same thing, of course, the gloves. And of course, how long could you leave your gloves off? You couldn't. 50 degrees below zero up there. And of course, another kind of interesting thing is that they used to give us a, a cheese sandwich to take on the mission to eat and a candy bar, see? And I'd stick them inside of my suit and warm them up, that's how, in order to eat them, you see? But that, that was the way they fed us. And of course, we wherever we went, that, that's what we got. But, uh, it, was, it was that kind of thing. and. Uh, you, you tried to keep warm if you could. You wore notches and masks after 10,000 10, feet. And a lot of us got frostbite, things like that, because you get moisture to come up over the top here on your face, you know, things like that. 
end if you were unfortunate. You could have a, something burn out. You'd be with a leg or something uncovered. I always managed to get the area stand right there to plug into it. And that's how you kept it going, you know. But it was that kind of thing. I'm trying to think of some of the things that were important there. And that, uh, you know, it's, uh, we all, of course, had our particular position. And every one of us, I think, could probably do the other job. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, the radio operator, I couldn't do that. But I could have operated a ball tour and I learned all that. Mm -hmm. I could have, uh, of course, waste gunners had uh, one, one gun to take care of. I had two. Now, did you ever shoot any German aircraft down? I, I was on the Schweinfurt mission. Uh, like, let, me, let me preface this by saying that you never made a claim for yourself. You were not allowed to do that okay, and sure. accept that. It had to be by somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, on that Schweinfurt mission, I was, I, they claimed five for me. Now, I know I didn't get five claims. So, basically speaking, uh, I have credit for one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that uh, of course, uh, that was about the extent of, uh, you know, this idea of shooting down everybody, you know, uh, didn't work. When they went by there at they're 300 miles an hour, and we're going 190, it's that pretty fast. And, you get your licks in what you can, and, and uh, but that day it was that day it was a lot of opportunity. You know. Now um, you received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Why, what was that for? Well, that's I suppose that's they, they call it extraordinary achievement. I believe it's, it's basically for um, the missions. I think one of the things, and I don't say this with any measure of pride, but I think we have to realize that that it wasn't easy in the beginning to fly. Uh, 25 missions. It's well known that, you know, three out of five people didn't make it. Uh, I also watched my colleagues and my friends in the barracks. I watched them. No one ever made it past 16 missions while I was there until we made it. We and another crew from another bomb squadron uh, finally made it. But uh, we watched people go out and not come back, and that was it. And, and the most memorable thing that I have is of the young crew that came in one night and put their bags down. And they were meeting to schedule for a mission the next day, and they never came back. It was their first and only mission, and there were their bags. And people may laugh at these kind of things or maybe even question it, but we had a gentleman's agreement. If anything happens to me, make sure that my things that belong to my family get to my family. But if I've got gum and candy and shoes and shirts and things like that that fit you, take them. And that's what we did. And that was a, that's the way it was. And there was a, no qualms about it and no feeling guilty about it. Mm -hmm. Because it was a, what else would they do but be carried over to the orderly room or something and dumped there and that would be the end of it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have a decent shirt and I needed it or somebody else, I don't remember doing a lot of that. But I was open to what would happen if anything happened to me. And I do remember, in De probably November, December of '43, feeling in, my, in myself that I, you know, I wasn't moving fast enough. I hadn't flown for a few days, and I was kind of impatient. And a fellow by the name of, uh, well, I've forgotten now what his, his last name was, an Italian fellow. He was a spare engineer, and uh, he uh, said to me, "Tom," he said, uh, "Don't push it." He says, "That's when they. That's when you'll get it." He says, just take them as they come. And, and I never forgot that because he was just coasting along. He'd get a mission here and there, you know. The, and they flew those engineers as, as a, what they called Tigerleers or spare gun, spare bombardiers. When they didn't have a bombardier, they put them up in the seat, let them, get, let them drop the bombs and kick them off. And I remember he took off one morning, and uh, of course I was in the barracks, and they came back and they said, well, <clears throat> such and such crashed on takeoff this morning. And then they told me of my friend, and he said he was he was propped just like he was sitting in the seat where the bombardier was, because he, he was going to take. And here was a fellow that told me, take it easy, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, don't push it. And I think he was right. I think he was right. I, you know, I was eager, but by the same token, I could have picked the wrong one, too. And, uh, now you, um, when you wrote this, you received your uh, distinguished flying cross from a uh, rather distinguished person. Yeah, I, I happened to be there when uh, General Carl Spatz was the head of the 8th Air Force for a while. Jimmy Doolittle, Jimmy Doolittle came. And Jimmy Doolittle and Carl, Dr. and Dr. I can say, uh, 
General Thomas Pants that he received by my uh, Distinguished Flying Cross. Yeah. 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 Quite a thrill for me because everybody knew we were on the mission, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to see this this man so well known, so it was a real honor. And uh, what they did was they, I have, I have, of course, the air medal. I don't have a lot of things in my life. Probably only got, I don't have any of these other ribbons. Somehow or other, didn't get them. But I do have that. I have the air medal with four leaf clusters. One for the aircraft shot down, the other three for missions and that. And I have a, I have one of the, the presidential unit citation that was given to the 390th bomb group for the joint mission. And having been with them, uh, we received it later on. We learned that we were, we received it too. Mm -hmm. So this other crew and ourselves got that. So other than that, I have no bunch of medals for being a hero. Now, you know, you said your entire crew, except for the pilot, survived the war? Yeah, he survived the war. Well, uh, did he go back on a, another mission, or...? I put my, uh, the man that was here just a few months ago, I and mean, he finished a mission before we did. And, uh, because he, uh, well, he, he was at that point. Mm -hmm. At that time, 25 missions was required. Mm -hmm. Sometime after that, it went to 30, and then 35, I think, and ultimately 50. Mm -hmm. But, uh... Keith, his name is. Keith's finished ahead of us, so we were without a pilot. So this is the grace of the, the man that was our first pilot, Bill Lakin. I, I love the man as a pilot, as a friend, but he was a fabulous guy. He came back. He was by this time <coughs> lead pilot in the, in the bomb group, and uh, so he wasn't with us anymore. Obviously, we had, Keith became our first pilot. We received another one for the co-pilot, but he came back and he said to the when we spoke to him, he says, I brought these young men over here, he says, and I'm flying them on their last mission. And he did. And we, we went and we, we were, wherever we were, we were having a tough time because we were, uh, we were over France and uh, trying to bomb the target. And whoever the lead bombardier was, he couldn't get, get a hold of them. So we who were leading, we were leading. And uh, we went over the target once he missed it. So we made it another circle, came back around, and, and uh, I guess uh, Bill said to him, he said, look, he says, you better get the target this time. He says, well, I'm dropping these things in the channel. He says, these guys are on their last mission. I'm not going to let them get shot down, because the fellow behind us was already flying on three engines, you know, trying to keep mm -hmm. up with us. But I never forgot Bill doing that, and uh, so he did. And, of course, we finished our tour. And uh, we were the first, I think, first ones ever to finish in our, in our bomb group. But remembering that uh, I don't know how many missions the bomb group had in then they ultimately had 306. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's, uh, you know, they flew a lot of, a lot of missions to burn them in places like that. And uh, so I'm looking at it last night, the, uh, we call it something like we had, we had 739 of our men who were prisoners of war from our bomb group. We had uh, 241 killed, killed in action. And then we had, they had a certain number that made it back. Sometimes these fellows would make it back from where they had been shot down, you know, because we got to see escape. Mm -hmm. And then they had a listing of our bomb groups and for the squadrons. And we had the 349th, which they said lost 51 aircraft. They had the you know, the 351st that lost 33, and the 418th that lost 36. And I remember these figures of the last night. They sent us a sheet some years ago with information. It's a big sheet. But anyway, we lost in the, in the 350th squadron, which is the squadron I think we lost 60. So we almost doubled it. So I guess we had a lot of action we didn't realize at the time. I don't think any of us realized at the time mm -hmm. who was losing the most as far as that went. So uh, when did you go back to the States? I went back in 44. Mm -hmm. I was uh, there probably seven, eight months. And when I went back, I, uh, of course, had to leave like everybody does, and that's where I met my wife. And uh, within six months, we were husband and wife. But uh, from there, we went to uh, 
did the training somewhere. I went to Texas, Laredo, Texas, for the training as a an area gunnery instructor. And of course, from there, I uh, ended up at West uh, at West Oregon Field here uh, as a, an instructor in air area gunnery on B-24s. So we spent our time there, and I spent the rest of my time uh, there. I was scheduled. Uh, I was scheduled to go to the Pacific. They had told me I'd have six months in the States, and then I was on my way. That time, B-29s were, you know, there. I expected that's what I probably would have been at least looking into some way. But uh, the war ending in Europe made all the difference. Because it kept me from having to go. I stayed there and continued to train crews because they were still fighting the Japanese, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, after a while, of course, then things settled down. And we waited to see how many points we had, how soon you could get out. So now, I, did you fly in B-24s while you were in the States? Just in, in every, every, I flew regularly. Mm -hmm. and I was, how did you like it compared to the B-17? Well, I'm favorable, of course. I, mm -hmm. Anybody who's been on a B-17 is going to say B-17s. Anybody on a B-24 is probably going to say the same. But we felt that the that the B B-17 was a workhorse. I mean, you could, the B-24 carried more bombs, and of course was, uh, I guess, I'd say just a bit, bit faster, but the uh, B-17 could take a real beating. And I've got pictures, I didn't bring them over here, but I've got pictures with the half the tail shot off, uh, flying along on our second last mission, the plane next to us had, had half the tail gone, it was still flying. And of course, uh, I've got one of the whole tail gone. They just blew the tail gunner right off. So that uh, we felt that was a very reliable plane, and we had a great bit of faith in it. And B-24, I, I can't judge it except to say uh, I flew lots of time in it because I would fly five hours in a day, a day mm -hmm. with the new crews. But uh, other than that, uh, I don't even know to some degree how well qualified I was to talk about turrets and and they had on those because they had different turrets. But that's where I was, and I was to know something if I had to. Okay. Now, this was a picture of you. If you hold it up, yeah. do you remember where and when that was taken? Well, I'm going to have to say it was taken before I went overseas, but I don't know. That would have to be in 43 sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that like that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay, got it. Could you turn the camera off? I'm sorry? Turn the camera off. Hey, uh, what color were the German parachutes? I'm trying to recollect that. My, my recollection of that was that they were, they were like an OD or something of that sort, darker than the, the Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you can see that I, I can recall counting 13 or some shoots in the air at one time. These things stick with you. You don't forget those things. Yeah. And uh, so, and they're watching what was going on that day along with, of course, being busy myself. So, mm -hmm. uh, some of these things I recollect, some things I don't remember. I've forgotten things, I'm sure, that were important things, but, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. When you left the service, did you use the GI Bill at all? Uh, only for only to buy a house that we didn't keep very long because we didn't stay there that long. Mm -hmm. we, we sold it many years ago, but no, just the GI Bill there. Uh, by the time I got ready to go to uh, to school, I, I mentioned that I was a you know, professional firefighter in Syracuse for 12 and a half years, so I was 36 years old and with three children and my wife when I resigned and went to uh, to, to college, I went to Rutgers University, and I well, went to Bangor, of course, I mentioned, and I went to Rutgers where I got a scholarship and, and uh, for seven years, then I went to seminary. So I was 42 when I was ordained as a pastor and came to the Unionville Church here as my first charge mm -hmm. in 1966. But uh, I had, you know, this is not relevant to some degree to to uh, what we're doing here today, but I have had some very real experiences in life that, that uh, without saying a lot, I can say that, you know, uh, I, I, of course, I'm a pastor when I preach, you know. So give me a little leeway here. But I simply was saying that God took from my way, took me through that, that war. Mm -hmm. And that was a blessing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to the, on the fire department and I finished my time there, although I resigned by choice. 
I finished my time there in an accident where two of my brothers were killed and I was badly injured. In fact, when I went to, when, when I went up to school, uh, to college, I still was having trouble with my equilibrium and that, but I had to make a decision and, and I did it. And uh, since I've been here, I spent six and a half months in St. Peter's Hospital, a thing called Gillian Murray. And uh, I guess I just want to say God has protected me, and that, that's my, my testimony, even more so than that I fought in the war. You know? and, uh, so I'm grateful for what you do here, and I, I'd be delighted to see I, some others have had such tremendous experiences and, and made such a contribution. Uh, I, even when I came through here and looked around and listened to some of the people, you know, see their stories, and you, you hear some some interesting things. I know yes. you do mm -hmm. doing this. But, uh, Let me ask you a couple other things. Did sure. you join any veterans organizations at all? Uh, I, I haven't been a part of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I just, uh, I guess I felt that I wasn't... Even the there. 8th Air Force Association? Well, well I belong to the 100th Bomb Group. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that. Yes, the 100th Bomb Group was, was titled the Bloody 100th because mm -hmm. of the many losses, I guess. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, that's that I belong to since the beginning. But I part of the reason why I didn't get into the others because there's there should be a requirement that you, you participate. You know, you do your part, and if you don't do your part, then you ought not to be in it. I could have joined the Veterans Board of the Wars, mm -hmm. it's just you know the the others. But I I feel that you got to do your part if you're going to do that. And I wouldn't be doing that. I always had as a firefighter, I worked 70 hours a week plus a part-time job as a guard for Greeks. So, mm -hmm. so I was a, I didn't have a lot of time. So I guess that's my best excuse I can find for that. Okay, did you uh, stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? I yeah. know you said a pilot. Yeah, well, we all, we, I got in touch with Tom. Keith was the fellow who did mm -hmm. this. He kept in touch with everybody and he would call me. And I, I've talked talk with two or three of them. They're all gone now except Keith and myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I talked with my bombardier, I talked to the waste gunner, and uh, of course with Keith, and I don't know who else. And some of them, one person we, we never found, you know, we never know what happened to have him. But the other other ones I learned about where they were in that. But they've all passed on now, so it's mm -hmm. Keith and I, he's 86 years old, and I'm 84. So a couple of old guys, I guess. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I tell you what, if I can go back a little bit, I'll make it real brief. I lived in a kind of a family where it wasn't very orderly. I was brought up until I was 18 years old when I kind of made this decision. I had, didn't have an easy life. I didn't have a close relationship with, I mean, family relationship. I did fine with my mom and dad, but as far as my parents and all that, it was just one of those disorganized groups. So to make a long story short, uh, for me, I've often said, that, you know, I, I didn't think I was had much to offer. I wasn't a high, big, stu great student in high school. I was small. I didn't play the sports. I couldn't qualify. Too small for football. Not good enough. But I have often said to people, when I, when it took a war, I said, to make me feel like I could make a contribution to something, that I counted for something. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. Because it made me feel for the first time that I had done something that was important. And I guess people recognized it, and I needed it. And now that I'm a pastor and know the needs of people, I understand how important that is. And whatever may be said here, well, kind of, in a sense, off, off the record, kind of not off the record, but aside, is that every person that you, you interview, uh, unless they're without feeling, they're going to feel uh, a privilege to do it. And some people say, well, I never, and my father never talks about the war. I in the sense I've never ceased to talk about it. People ask me, my grandchildren know what it's about, and uh, I've got a lot of great grandchildren too. But I, I want to thank you for doing this, and also say that, you know, I'm sure that people find it rewarding for, for it to, to happen. And that's, that's what, for me, it made a difference the war did. It was the beginning, and of course, then I met my wife, and that was really beginning lots of life for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, the privilege of I love being a firefighter. I would never have left it for any other reason than the reason I'm here in the church. And but I've been rewarded in lots of ways. People I've met, 
every once in a while so we meet somebody, we talk about the old days, and like today, and I remember that I had at least made a contribution of a sort. And uh, I'm glad I wasn't, didn't have to bail out. I'm glad I wasn't a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I didn't get shot up like some of these poor fellows. But at times you, you say, well, look what happened to them. You know, how much of a contribution they made. But I guess we did our part. That was what we were called, you know. Um, I guess we'll take, go ahead and put it painted on the Yeah, chair. there's something like that. I think they're all on there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing on the front? The decoration's all on the back? I think there's just, no, the only thing that's on the, oh, I'm sorry. That's the only right. thing is there is the, just the, the patch on the sleeve, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I just, I kept it for so many years in the trunk, you know. Of course, I couldn't begin to get in it now. We weighed 136 <laughs> pounds when it was there. It's trunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's trunk. Pretty scooby. Yeah, 136 pounds. Could you turn those uh, lights back on? Maybe it might be a little better. Yeah. Yeah. It's we had an interview down in Long Island. The gentleman came in the room with his jacket on, and he was one of the. He came in and after we took a picture of him. Picture of him. He unzipped it. And he was oh God. <laughs> it's like a girdle. I admire these fellows. They can still get into their uniform. You know, it's part of person they are. I like that. Kid, my wife, I say, you know, you weighed more than I did when I married you. <laughs> Not today. She's a hundred and thirty pounds or something. I'm a big guy. Yeah. I don't have a lot of things, but I do have some things. You know, some people really have a, a lot of things. But okay. We thank you. Thank you.